The dollar over the last few days has been climbing, actually the last few weeks, if you look here. Um, what people don't understand is that it's been climbing while our markets are going up. Normally the dollar, dollar strength will be tougher on um, the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Russell, anybody who has international business. And you'll still see some of that, right? Like you'll see that probably with Tesla and a few others, Apple um, getting hurt because of their business with China because a stronger dollar means they get less dollars uh, from the foreign currency, but whatever they're selling it as, they'll end up getting less dollars because of the weakness in that currency and the strength of the dollar. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the strength in the dollar is directly attributed to weakness in the Chinese yuan. A few other currencies too. There's stuff going on in Japan. I don't want to discount that. But China needs to be the focus they're trying to maintain this peg around the 7.3 zone. Um, but as you can see recently here, it's we're screaming back up in strength with the dollar. And I think that this is going to de-peg without China doing some major things to try and correct this. And they can try and pump in liquidity. They can do a lot of things, but they've created so much damage to their economy in the last few years, actually like the last, like a while, but really since the pandemic, that I think a lot of it is just simply irreversible. And this video will be talking about the damage that's going on in China's economy and how I believe that will play out over the next year or two. So it's a good one. It's a good thing to understand. Second biggest economy in the world um, so it's something you should understand and it's something you should put some effort into because what happens with them will have first, second, third order effects that will affect every other part of the world. So it's important to understand. All right. So let's, you probably heard this one and here, let me actually zoom in. I want to get this. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, this is a demographic. It's, it's the demographic mountain that you, maybe you've seen, maybe you haven't that shows the population by age range. And this is important. America's has some problems too. But this one's a comparison between India and China. And what I want you to note here is there is a 25-year gap, roughly, from where you could see the population, where it starts to drop a little bit in India, and it's not dropping that much, right? Well, look at China. China's big population right now is between 35 and 39. And really, if you broaden this out, like the largest population is probably between like 35 and their 60s. Now, that's that's definitely aging. And it's very problematic. Because since there's no nobody having kids anymore, and if you look at this, this is a dramatic drop. And this has to come from a, a number of things, right? China had a one child policy for a couple of decades that was just devastating. They thought it was smart. They want, they, they, they didn't want to have to deal with starvation and things that happened during the time of Mao. And so they said, hey, you know what we'll do? The state, the top-down approaches are great. Centralization is great. We can see the problem. So let's just make it to where people can only have one kid. And that won't cause any major issues down the road. And so they did that. And, uh, and it went on for a long time. They lifted it years ago. But the problem is, People still aren't having kids. And now it's different. It's different because they have so many issues, which we'll be elaborating on in a little bit here, that people don't want to have kids. We already have issues in society where as they develop and they become richer, and China's not rich by any means, but we'll go into that maybe a little bit too. But as they become richer, people have less children, right? Right. They get more educated, they decide to wait a little while, then they realize they've waited too long, and they question whether or not they want to... We have that same kind of thing going on all around the world, right? The United States has this happening too. But China has it happening like two, threefold. The amount of children that they're having right now is nothing. Because they... Again, all the issues, and we're going to go back. We're going to talk about some of these issues. So I want to go. I want to start. I want to look at uh, Macro Alf. He did a little write up today. It says uh, and follow him on X. I don't know. Remember, I can't remember if he has a YouTube, but he's definitely on X. Uh, he says the Chinese economy has never looked more fragile than today. 
Here's what's happening and why it matters to global markets. The first thing he jumps into is the demographic concerns. And these are projections from China's official numbers, which are horrific lies at best. It's important to know that China has removed about 93% of their economic data since around the pandemic, maybe a little bit before. So why would a country do that? Why would they remove almost all their economic data? It's to hide the truth. This is a communist dictatorship that uses prop. They have. They literally have a department of propaganda. You think we're bad here in the U.S. and that there's propaganda again from the Republicans and the Democrats? It fucking pales in comparison to what happens in China. Censorship, propaganda, horrific acts—they're a daily occurrence in this country. So this is official government data, and it's bullshit. India is already has a greater population than China. It's probably even worse than that. But what this shows is population 20 to 59. It shows that they peaked out a decade ago. And that the projections show them going down. These are too optimistic. But even if these weren't optimistic, this is a major concern. But it's worse than this. Trust me. All right was already biting in the background, and so the Chinese ability to generate structural growth started fading rapidly in the 2010s. How to fix that? With leverage, of course. After the great financial crisis of 2008, the West delevered, while China went on a huge credit binge. China didn't have a 2008. They didn't have that because they decided, you know what we should do? Build infrastructure. We should build trains to nowhere, and make, make sure everybody's impressed by these. Show them how great these are. Even if they lose us billions a year, are completely inefficient. We have way too many of them. And they're unsustainable. And they'll never be needed. They weren't needed at peak. And now that their society is in decline, they're definitely not needed. And now they're just additional expense. Two local governments that have a 5% GDP mandate that never changes, and if anything would only go up. Even this year, all the problems they've had, still pushing 5%. So these local government entities, they're, they're, they're just trying to generate whatever 5% is. Even though some of them are so heavily indebted in the shadow banking sector that it's fucking frightening. But what, what Macro Alpha is referencing here is, again, the West repaired balance sheets, China levered up. You can see how U.S. private sector debt as a percent of GDP went down. Still lower than it was in 2008, right? And this is like eh, into 2022, beginning of 2023. This is a little outdated. So ours has probably went up a little bit. But again, we also raised rates at an aggressive rate. So if anything... It's up because of that, but there hasn't been a lot of new lending. So we haven't really seen a lot of problems since this is, since this, this chart kind of comes to an end. But China is basically right now probably at least 2x levered versus the United States right now. And that doesn't include local government financing entities that are in the shadow banking sector that we can only imagine how much debt there is. It is horrific. So China's balance sheet is really bad. Really, really bad. But it gets worse for them. It says between 2012 and 2016, Chinese corporate sector on most uh, took on most of the burden as companies tried to lever up their business models and expand operations in the West. But the second phase of the credit binge was driven by Chinese households. This doesn't even cover all of it. But you can start to see some of the problem here, right? This is household debt in China. So you can see where there wasn't much. 2008 range, look at that, hardly any. But look at it here as of the end of 20, 2022. It is way higher than this. It's probably over the US and UK right now as a percent of GDP. If we're looking at real numbers, I have no doubt it is. But even by official no numbers right now, since this ends in 2022, it's probably already accelerated past that. So these people are heavily indebted, heavily indebted now at, at an individual level. Their corporations are heavily indebted. 
their government is indebted and doesn't have near the cash position that it had in 2008. China was arguably rich and they had so much foreign direct investment. It's all gone. All of it. 30, 35 year lows. Some, some, in some circumstances, it's worse than that. He says the Chinese business model doesn't center around rewarding workers with higher wages uh, growth as that would hurt Chinese exports. Again, so they, so China, no, nobody watches my videos because um, they're, they're a decent amount of them, like China Observer and some of these others, China Insights, they come from Falun Gong, right? And these are people that have been heavily persecuted by China. And so people assume that everything that comes from them is false. But I've been watching these guys for like six, seven years, and I can tell you that the accuracy rate is probably at least 75%. So there's a lot of signal in these things. And China's been, China, China across their across the government levels, CCP levels, and private business, especially in manufacturing, have been cutting wages sometimes in half over the last several years, starting probably mostly during the pandemic and then just getting worse. So if you can imagine losing half your income and trying to survive while finding jobs and it's just, it's just incredibly difficult and you don't want to take any more debt on because like again they're probably they're more indebted than us these are very problematic things so again it's just not good now here's something else i want to point out that's really important look at this look at the amount this is china over here on the left look at the amount of their wealth that is in real estate it's an unhealthy amount now, their real estate prices have been dropping for more than three years. Look at the United States. Look at how diverse our, our, our portfolio is here as far as where our assets lie on an individual level. It's very, very, very well balanced. Very well balanced. China's is devastatingly bad. They have no stock market. They have real estate, and that's it. And all these people have been doing is losing money for three years. Xi Jinping applied a clampdown in the property sector with the intent to signal, send a signal um, to basically try and get it to where they weren't, it wasn't a rational exuberance and to delever the bubble. But the problem is the bubble had been going on for decades and you can't do that. You can't do that. Look at this. Chinese floor space. This is under construction versus sales. Look at this, sales, look at this. For three years, just in dramatic decline. But construction was still kind of chugging along. So since these lag substantially, since, since the actual sales of uh, the construction cycle lags, we're seeing the effects now of construction stopping in this country, dramatically. Let me see, there's another one I wanted to show here. Ah. Here's my other one. This is another one I wanted to show you. Evergrande. And again, not Country Garden, not Zung. Oh, I can't even remember the other one. There's so many real estate portions of, their, of the country that are failing. But Evergrande inflated sales by $78 billion. To put this in perspective, the fraud that was Enron, a big thing in the United States in 2001, $600 million in fraud. WorldCom was a big thing around the dot-com bubble. $11 billion in fraud. This was $78 billion. Dwarfs everything in history. Everything. So think about that. <laughs> think about that. And the fact that their property sector is just devastated and gone. And it makes up 62% of their wealth of these individual households. And at the same time, foreign investment is plummeting. And you can see in normal times, the private sector, so the leverage, the leverage that households, corporations, um, local gov government financing vehicles, um, the government itself, the leverage that they take on during good times is okay. It allows credit creation, allows he healthy banks and private sector. But... When balance sheet recessions are occurring, which is what we're seeing right now, private sector deposits, loan mortgages, and private sector deposits and loan mortgages are gone. Deleveraging occurs. 
creates money destruction. There's no appetite for credit anymore. People just want to save because they're scared. They want to make sure they can buy, get, get food and hopefully have a place to live. They are hearing about all their friends getting a half the paycheck they were getting before or that they've, they're homeless now because they lost their fucking job and they can't get another one. I, I've watched videos of people crying because they applied for 1,000 jobs. 1,000. And they can't get calls back. Or if they do, they end up canceling before they even interview them. And these people are highly qualified. Highly qualified. Imagine going to a prestigious Chinese university and doing everything right. Everything. Having the right family, having everything behind you. And then you lose a job or you quit and then find out that you can't get another one again. That's what these guys are going through. And so again, no, no credit for, no, no appetite for credit. The deleveraging occurs. Prices are, are dropping. More people are getting fired from different parts of the industry. You can't use your house to be able to take out debt because people are like, eh, it dropped at 7% in value in the last year. 5% in value in the last year. So they have none of this. And then he's saying, if it's sustained for a prolonged period of time, this is where you get the balance sheet recession. And it's a revolving door of pain and suffering. What's ironic about this is this is the same shit that Ray Dalio has been talking about for years that was going to destroy the United States. And he was completely fucking wrong about what country this was happening in. He was heavily investing in China, like a moron while writing books about the destruction and the fourth turning and all. And don't get me wrong, the fourth turning is a very real uh, sequence of events. And we're probably in one. And that could lead to a broader world war, all kinds of problems. But China is not the victor in this. They could be the destroyer, but they're not the victor by any means. Again, so nobody wants new mortgages and when they're busy repairing their balance sheet, right? And he's showing here that government bonds are falling through the floor. They're falling through the floor in China. They have, there's no hope in China. It says, with rates dropping in China while the Fed promises only a mild cutting cycle, interest rate differentials are widening further. This pressures the CNY, uh, on the CNY, the Chinese yuan, is building and China is trying to defend the 720. I showed you a little bit of that earlier, right? Right here. They're trying to defend. It's actually 730. They're trying to defend this zone so it doesn't start to weaken against the dollar even more. Why does this matter? Chinese capital controls and the lack of sizable capital market interconnections mean the weakness in the property sector remains isolated to China for now. He's right. And they have the ability to be able to print for a while. They have a, the ability to be able to mask the pain and suffering um, if nothing else, just through propaganda. And there's plenty of Western, stupid, ignorant investors that eat that shit up and will buy Alibaba or whatever else, Neo, whatever else other Chinese trash stock there is out there. And Alibaba is actually would be one of the better ones, but we'll go into why you don't want to touch that one either. Anyway. So he's talking about Chinese capital controls and the lack of a sizable capital market interconnections mean the weakness in the property sector remains isolated to China for now. But China is a big investor in other countries and this flow of money will quickly dry up. So he's right, Belt and Road Initiative, that has dried up a ton. There are a fraction of the people involved in that that there used to be. And there's many countries and African nations. You can see this says, finally, China is a large trade in a part. Oh, no, I'm not going to go to that yet. We don't want to look at that yet. I'll focus on some of the rest of this. So there's countries in Africa and South America, including a country that I've been to numerous times, Panama, that have had heavy inflows of Chinese investment. And a lot of these countries have been screwed in some way. And, and or like, again, the loans that China was giving out weren't like the ones you'd get from the WTO, the World Trade Organization, or like, I should say the, the government, uh, international financing uh, tools and mechanisms, right? That which would be lower interest rates and more affordable because these nations couldn't afford a lot. No, they were sizable. They were two to three times the percentage rates. They were longer terms. They were, if you can't pay it back, we're taking some shit. And then they did the same thing they did in China. They're like, let's build you a huge dam that destroys your ecosystem and that has cracks in it a few years later. 
Let's build out some infrastructure that starts falling apart or that doesn't actually go anywhere and doesn't create real GDP. The same things they did in China. And so they've soured these relationships and they've also indebted these other countries around the world. Now, this is another interest, interesting slide that um, Alf has here. It says, finally, China is a large trade partner for many other countries. It's actually become the largest trade partner uh, out there for many. As domestic growth is under pressure, trade flows could slow and hamper foreign, com com uh, foreign economies, too. I 100% agree with this. I do think that this is kind of happening, but there's, there's a positive with China's demise, too, that we need to talk about. But this is a very important thing to look at. It says, countries which share greater trade, trade with China. In 2000, look at that number. Look at this top portion. It's almost all of it's the United States, right? A little bit with China for some of these others. Africa, you know, other parts over here of Asia. Look at 2020. China was buying the world. They were, they were giving away fake money. <laughs> Heavily indebting countries. Um, getting them to trade with them for cheap goods, including us, right? Like we buy cheap goods from China all the time. It's changing. Now, now our largest trade partner is Mexico. It's not China. But this is important. There are, there are countries, and uh, it looks like Mac, Macro Alpha is creating a fund. I don't know anything about that. So let's skip that part. But again, so China ha is very interconnected with the rest of the world. Uh, I don't have the graph right in front of me. Should have brought it up. But... About 67% of China's exports go to democratic countries or Western countries, right? So they're also heavily dependent upon us. Heavily dependent upon Western-aligned countries. Because two-thirds of their exports come to us. And so they are in a desperate need for Timu and other Chinese products to be successful and to not get regulated. They use TikTok to try and be able to control and influence our population on China. And there's tons of data with this that shows that like, like the way the war with Israel and the Palestinians is interpreted on TikTok. Heavily biased compared to other social media platforms out there. Towards one side, I'll let you guess which one that is. Ukraine and Russia, again, a certain viewpoint. And it's usually the one that China wants. So you have to realize that China's very good at trying to influence their own people. And they've been trying to do that with the rest of the world, whether it's with money, whether it's with influence, persuasion, social media. It, it's like, it's ridiculous. On Facebook, I got blocked numerous times from my own fucking group for investment. Ask me why. Okay, I'll tell you. Thank you for asking. Because I said bad things about China. I just reported facts. I didn't say anything derogatory. But Chinese bots went into my fucking group and reported me every time I did this. And then, for whatever reasons, and then I would sometimes get kicked out of a group I'm the main administrator and moderator of for a week because I reported things that weren't optimistic about China. That's the kind of level of control these guys have. It's very important to realize that. It's why I'm on X now. Because I can actually say what I want. This platform is a godsend for freedom in America and around the world. And again, the, I think so many people don't want to believe that China is in demise. Because they've received so much influence over the years telling them that China isn't a paper ta tiger and that they're incredibly powerful. And don't get me wrong, they do have power. They do still have numbers. And they are spending a lot of money. When you look at how far the Chinese yuan goes for their military, that's where they're spending more than the United States is, right? And they're stealing espionage. You know, they've been using tactics for decades where if you do business in China, you have to have a, a partner... And that partner will steal all your trade secrets. And then potentially, if you're small enough and you don't really fucking matter, they'll just kick you out of the country and they'll be the ones doing the product now and making all the money from it. And so, like, this is the stuff that's been happening for years. But now all of that's changing. Foreign direct investment in China is non-existent. Let me see if I can find a slide here. 
and maybe I lost it. I might have to find it again. I will. I will. I'll find it. Don't worry. I want to hit on a couple of things, and then I'm going to hit on foreign direct investment, and then I want to talk about my thoughts about the demise of China and maybe how long it can take and how, what the impact will be. All right, so crackdowns. Why is China also in a really tough place? It's because they cracked down in the real estate market. We touched on that a little bit ago, right? But not just that, everything. And this is Tencent's response. Tencent, another company that was huge in China, says to pilot a new initiative with the popular game Honor of Kings, reduce the gaming time for minors. Prohibit minors under 12 from top, topping up in online games. Crack down on using false identity and cheating in games. Eventually, China just said, nope, you can only do like so many hours a day on games. And children can't do this. And there's only certain times of the week you can do this. Can you imagine living in a country where you can't play a fucking video game when you want to? That's what's going on in China. They, they get pissed because we're talking about banning TikTok, but they won't even let that shit into their country. Instead, you have Xi Jinping's thoughts on some informational app on their side where you get to learn about what Xi Jinping thinks if you want your social credit score to go up. And they can't even play video games anymore. And so we crack down on the gaming sector. We crack down on the real estate sector. They crack down on corruption and capitalistic powers with companies like Alibaba. Jack Ma was one of the richest people in China. They took his fucking company away from him, made him disappear for a long period of time. And it's not just him. They did this with tons of companies. But it isn't just this. During the pandemic, they locked down for over three years. People had to wear masks. They had to go through and take COVID tests all the fucking time. Small businesses were destroyed. From the numbers I'm seeing, it was over a million. Imagine that. Imagine the level of destruction within that country. So you've destroyed your real estate sector. For three years, it's been bleeding, and it makes up 62% of the wealth of your people. You fucked all the small businesses, all the tiny restaurants. And watch my videos about China when I post them. Don't just ignore them. Don't ignore what's really going on in that country. It is a disservice to yourself in understanding what's happening with a large portion of the world in the next couple of years. But they destroyed their real estate, they destroyed their gaming sector and technology sector. They destroyed Alibaba and so many other corporations. They destroyed small business all across the country and still are. And what else did they destroy? Let's see here. Oh, private education. They actually had a huge private education wing where they would learn English so that they could do business with overseas, where they would learn all kinds of things so that they could give their kids an advantage. They destroyed that too. That's gone. So if you can imagine be trying to be in a business in this country, and if you're too powerful, they just ghost you. You could be like a prominent figure like Jack Ma, leaning towards capitalism, and they just make you go away. This is why, and I talked about foreign direct investment. I'm going to back up the truck here a little bit. I should have had these slides in a better order. So I do apologize, but let me see here real quick. Let me find China. China's in here somewhere. Let me see. No. Okay. Let me just scroll down. Got it. There we go. There we go. So there's some things I want to show you. There's so, so many bad things in China, but let's look at this Chinese direct foreign investment. This is actually outdated. It's gotten worse. If you can imagine that it's negative again. So nobody is investing in this country anymore. And then you've destroyed all these sectors of your economy. Everybody's highly indebted, indebted. Local government financing entities and local governments are the worst, guys. There are so many gov like government provinces in China that are completely and utterly bankrupt, but just coasting right now. And then you have export decline, which they've been seeing too. I don't know if I have the slide on here for it, but they have export decline. You have a demographic cliff. 
You have construction going down. This is a great video, by the way. This is a really great video going deep into China and why this man is still shorting this market. Let me see here. PPI deflation. Oh yeah, got to talk about this. Look at the deflation in this country. It is so powerful, guys. It is so powerful. This is the killer of civilizations. Their inflation rate is just red. They're already in a spiral. They've got massive amounts of debt. They've got more than 2x, 3x the level of debt all across their country that we have, at least at least, least at the corporate level and the local government financing level, right? <laughs> it's so bad. And again, look at like uh, auto. And, oh, and, and, and here's the thing. What are they trying to do to correct this? What are they trying to do to correct this? A number of things, right? They're trying to finance the EV sector. They're trying to finance the renewable sector. They're trying to produce more of these goods and flood international markets so that they can keep these portions of their, of their business and infrastructure alive. They're trying to build out a chip sector. They're trying to build out a robotic sector. These are the latest narratives that they're trying to go with. But here's the thing. AI doesn't work in China. Ask me why. Okay, thank you. Here's why it doesn't work. Think about an LLM. Think about a large language model, right? Then censor the shit out of the content in it. Make a third of the words, or maybe like a fifth of the things that are talked about, censored. Now, you have an AI trying to answer questions, but a ton of the shit, it doesn't even know the answers to because the government is afraid of people actually knowing the truth. So you can't, you can't have large language models that work in China. You can't have truly intelligent AI that can do like chat GBT type stuff. I, I, I wish I could find the videos for some of their AI and it's just literally a back end like we're paying for chat GPT and we're trying to incorporate it into our technology and then use it to answer questions but it can't fucking answer them because almost anything that you want to talk about, like let's say economic data or anything, just even Winnie the Pooh, you can't even fucking get answers on Winnie the Pooh. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't have heavy censorship and have truth. You can't. This is what Elon Musk keeps talking about. If you censor, you don't have truth. So AI doesn't work. And the flooding of the market that they're doing in these sectors is just going to tariff the shit out of them and make it to where countries like the United States and most of Europe, which is already looking to do this, are going to prevent the EVs from coming into these countries because they're going to work to make them unaffordable. And then no matter how much China tries to flood the market, they, they're subsidizing all these markets and, and they, they don't have enough runway. So... Here's the thing. I'm not saying China's falling overnight. Let me just recap here. I'm not saying that. China could go on for another year this way. I could see another year, maybe more, right? Like maybe it's the same wicked peak cycle that we're going to see across everything when, when the U.S. actually starts to really get some pain because I think we, I think we will hit, get some at some point. It's just not now. It's not during, if you guys are playing micro to macro bingo, it's not... It's not during an election year, one of the largest number of elections on, on, on earth right now. I think four and a half billion people are going to be voting for a president um, or leader, prime minister, whatever, in their country this year. And so you have all this liquidity that's out there. You have global liquidity that's strong. It's not going to be now where China fails, right? Um, they are failing. They're in the process of failing. But it's it's not going to be now. It's going to be later. And, um, and the pain... The pain, I don't know. I have at least a year out before they start to feel a ton of pain from my projections. And I'll try and see if I can uh, make those more colorful and more articulate as time goes on. This video was just for people who don't know. If you don't know the pain that is existing in China. And, oh, and something else I want to cover real quick before I wrap. So China's having to, Chinese companies are having to move out of China and move into other parts of the world. Um, in order to be able to just kind of delever and make it to where manufacturers will still work with them. And that's because of things like the CHIPS Act. 
um, and and you know EV subsidies and the things that we're doing where they have to source from non-combative countries, however the terminology is, basically China, Russia, right, and and some Arab nations, um, obviously not North Korea, you know places like this, right, like the axis of evil, we'll call it. Um, so so so. So they're, these companies are having to push away. Now, don't get me wrong. There could still be profits that get back to China and their corporations, but they, the business, the, the employment, the things that are real core economic drivers are in these other countries. They're going to Mexico, right? Like on here, they're going to Mexico. They're going to India. They're going to Vietnam. They're going to the Philippines. They're going to Singapore. They're going to just every other country that you can think of that can have a strong relationship with the West. Um, where they could get, where they could basically de-lever a little bit from China and make it to where we'll still do business with them. So you just have, you, they're failing. China's failing on so many different levels. It's only going to get worse. Their currency is in the process of collapsing. That is what is causing the dollar to go up right now. Nobody cares about Russia anymore. Russia's a failing state. Um, I don't know that we're going to fund Ukraine war very much anymore. But Russia, totally miscalculated. China now has the worries of, yeah, we can go to war. But they look at what Russia did and they're like, damn, that didn't go. Putin thought he'd get Ukraine in a week. And look at, look at the clusterfuck it's turned into. And the Palestinian-Israeli war. I mean, Russia definitely had an opinion there and China backed them on it, right? They weren't friends of Israel anymore. So you could see how these divisions, they I think they were trying to create division, trying to create chaos. I think that's what this Israeli war was about too. It was factions tied with Hamas and Qatar and a bunch of other, you know, terrorist organizations that war were trying to create more chaos in another front of war. Um, Armenia, Azerbaijan, I that's kind of been flaming up on and off. I think that's another front that they're trying to create. I think there's there was there was some push to try and destabilize the West. I don't think it's going as well as they would like. And I think if anything, it's just creating more problems. Um, the Russian ruble is a disaster right now and has no international trading power. That, that was the goal, right? They wanted to delever from the dollar. They didn't realize we were gonna freeze all their funds. Whether you're for that, against it, it doesn't matter. The outcome was devastating to Russia and still is. And they've seen massive People leaving their country, money leaving their country, and China, back to China. That same thing has happened with them. Massive capital flight. And they're working hard to tighten down controls to prevent capital from being able to flee. Um, I would not go to Hong Kong anytime soon. It is very difficult for Chinese people to get money out, even from there. Um, it's just becoming harder and harder to do that. But again, if we just, let me just recap here. Their currency is collapsing. They've got a demographic cliff. They're highly indebted, whether it's corporations, individuals, local government financing vehicles from provinces, it doesn't matter. They clamped down on their economy for three plus years in lockdowns, destroyed over a million small businesses, devastated their property sector, which makes up 62% of the people's wealth, an unhealthy amount of their wealth. We're only in the 20%, low 20s. They destroyed their tax sector. We helped destroy their tech sector. They destroyed their gaming. They destroyed private education. We've done the chips crackdown with them, um, making it to where they can't get the equipment from ASML and these other, I mean, really the biggest manufacturer, uh, the biggest company that creates the products that foundries use to build their chips. And then we created incentives with the chip acts and EVs to basically push away from China their entire economy is in free fall. They're reducing pay by 50%. They're, they've they got manufacturing places shutting down like crazy. They've got storefronts shutting down like crazy. Start watching my videos so you understand what's happening there. Again, it's not 100% the truth, but it's a pretty good truth. And it's stuff you need to understand. And so to wrap, you know, just all the other stuff I've talked about, I probably missed a few talking points at the end. Their economy is devastated. Don't fucking invest in it unless you're a moron who didn't understand anything you just heard and can't do any research on your own. If you are a moron, put all your money in the country. I think that's a smart idea. If you're a moron 
and you want to lose all your money, do it. Because it's not like this peg is going to break here. And it will. <laughs> and then China becomes more fucked. It's not like that's not going to happen. But it will. And uh, again, the aftermath. The aftermath. So we're seeing some positive things coming up. And I'll, maybe that's what I'll do. I'll do a part two of this. That's going to include the positive ramifications for other countries around the world from China's demise. And I've been saying this for about two years now that I, I know China's failing. Um, and it's only gotten worse. All the data <laughs> reaffirms everything I ever believed. And then some. It's worse than I ever could have imagined. And, uh, but, but, in the process of their failure, I think that it might save us. And that's what I'll talk about in part two. I hope you guys got something out of this video. Probably going to wrap it since it's 41 minutes. Love ya. Um, and I'll do another one here later. Talk to you later, guys. Love you. Bye.